Welcome to Everyone Loves Guitar, where we get to sit down and talk with interesting professional guitar players and related music industry experts. If you love playing guitar, stick around. You're in the right place. Hey, this is Craig Garber from Everyone Loves Guitar. And before we start today's show, I wanted to talk to all the guitar players out there about something really interesting. If you're a guitar player or probably any other kind of musician, or if you know a musician who's looking to make some more money without having to tour or go on the road or put up with any of the other BS that musicians normally have to deal with, then what I'm about to tell you is probably the most exciting and important message you'll ever hear. As a business guy who just happens to play guitar, one of the first things I realized after interviewing, say, the first 50 or so guitar players was that if I was going to get into this business today, the first thing I'd look at doing is learning how to license your music. And by licensing music, I mean getting your music inserted into movies, television shows, and commercials. And here's why. There are four reasons, actually. First of all, focusing on record deals, publishing, and touring means that you're putting your destiny in someone else's hands. You're at the whim of someone who has literally thousands of other people competing for their attention, many of whom, frankly, may have music with more commercial appeal than your music has, which means you get what's ever left over as far as attention from that particular manager, publisher, publicist, or booking agent, right? And I don't know how you feel, but for me, I'm totally uncomfortable leaving my destiny and my family's financial future up to someone else. Second, I've learned in business that if you work in areas that are less competitive and not as crowded, your likelihood of success goes up dramatically. And there are way less people competing to have their music licensed than there are trying to make records, get their songs published, and go on tour. In fact, there are so many people competing to play music, the average working musician today, by and large, earns the same or less money than they were making back in the 1970s and 1980s. Third, in the licensing business, it's not unusual to have one or more of your songs wind up paying you multiple times over and over again. In some cases, day after day, week after week, month after month, and year after year. In fact, some songs you even get paid on multiple times over from a variety of sources because different people wind up licensing that same song from you. Many times you get paid for songs you recorded months or even years ago. So no work you do is ever wasted. Even if a particular song doesn't get picked up right now, there's a very good chance it can get picked up later. And the more music you write, the more opportunities you get for placements. The more placements, the more money you make, both up front as income from licensing fees and on the backside in terms of royalties for years to come. And the fourth reason I like this industry is that a free ebook has just been published, which pretty much takes you by the hand and shows you step by step how to get your music licensed. The book is less than 20 pages long, and it was written by Mike Elsner, who I interviewed in episode number 167 of this show. Mike's been doing this for over 14 years, and he's actually had over 2,000 songs licensed at this point in time. Now, I want you to pay attention to something, because that means he's getting paid to license almost 150 songs per year. Now, keep in mind, most successful career musicians don't even get paid for 150 songs in total over a 30 or 40 year career, yet Mike's getting paid for this on an annual basis. And in this free ebook, you'll discover the four simple steps to licensing success, including step one, which actually shows you how to get paid a significant upfront licensing fee as well as quarterly royalties. You'll learn how to get paid for learning how to play a new instrument. And I'm not kidding, he actually shows you an example of he basically practiced a new instrument and he licensed all the songs and he walks you through this. In step two, you'll learn how to quickly expand your song catalog by five to six times its current size without having to create literally anything new. That's right. You'll learn how to easily turn 10 songs into 50 to 60 songs in less than five minutes each. And each one of those new songs now becomes another new asset you can sell. You'll learn what to do and maybe even more important, what not to do to get your music quickly noticed by music supervisors. And this one simple nugget alone easily makes the difference between regularly getting your music licensed and never getting it licensed at all. He'll show you four ways to get paid to license your music, and then you get to pick and choose which one of those four ways works best for you. And you'll also get to uncover little-known secrets to using common websites online to get free names of people who would want to license your music. And the other cool thing I like about this business is that you can run it all from your home studio. No ivory tower record label executives telling you what to play and how to play it, and no shady managers or backroom publishers with their own agenda telling you what to do. So download Mike's free ebook on music licensing right now. Just go to everyonelovesguitar.com forward slash Mike. 
That's everyoneloversguitar.com forward slash Mike, M-I-K-E. That's it. Real simple. Let me know how you like the book. And now let's get on with the show. Hey, everybody. This is Craig Garber from Everyone Loves Guitar. We're going to do a couple of things different today. First of all, we're going to show some love to the keyboard section of the band. I've got a, not just an amazing keyboard player, but like Timothy Drury, who's my guest today, is a, just a brilliant guy and he's a brilliant artist. He's like overall, he's one of these guys where, you know, he's always creating something and he's doing it at a high level. And we'll talk about a lot of his stuff. He's got a an extensive background in composing, songwriting, performance, recording, photography, and videography. And he spent more than 25 years performing on world tours with some of the biggest rock bands in the music industry, like the Eagles, Don Henley, Don Felder, Joe Walsh. He was with Whitesnake for nine years and Stevie Nicks. He played keyboards, guitar, and sang with the Eagles on their Hell Freezes Over tour from 94 to 2000. He played with Whitesnake from 2003 to 2010 and is currently touring as a keyboardist for Don Felder. He also performed on and co-wrote most of the songs on Felder's latest record, Road to Forever, including the singles You Don't Have Me and Wash Away with Don Felder and Sticks as Tommy Shaw. His first big break in music actually came with Don Henley in 1989 when he was chosen to play on Henley's The End of the Innocence Tour, which is super popular. And he co-wrote Don Henley's song Everything is Different Now, which was re-released again on Don Henley's Greatest Hits Package. And a song with Stevie Nicks called That Made Me Stronger, produced by his old Henley touring mate, Sheryl Crow. Other notable projects include composing for film and television, which we'll talk about, and the collaborative creation of an opera with John Anderson, who is obviously the lead singer, the former lead singer. I don't know what to say nowadays. You can't say this. And he used to sing with Yes. Maybe he still does. Maybe I don't know what the iteration is, but he's a great lead singer. So anyway, <laughs> Timothy, thanks so much for coming on the show, man. I appreciate it. You bet. You bet, man. Happy to be here. Right. Hey, earlier in your career, you were a staff writer with Warner Chapel Publishing, and I was wondering how that came about and what was your ex overall experience in doing that? Uh, overall, it was a great experience. Uh, it came about, uh, again, through my friend Cheryl Crow. Uh, we were touring together with Don Henley. And she had gotten a publishing deal and was very excited about it. And she realized that I was um, composing and writing a lot of songs and collaborating with people. And she was starting to see that there would be some value for me to be a staff writer uh, to at least try to get some cuts. And um, so she set up a meeting for me at Warner Chapel. And I went in with a bunch of my demos. And uh, Judy Stakey, the lady who was listening to my songs, was really moved by my work, I guess, and uh, offered me a deal. So I had a deal. It was probably about a four year deal. And I had to turn in a, a certain amount of songs every year and try to get cuts. And, uh, and, uh, it, it was cool. It was really cool. It kind of forced me to, uh, spend a lot of time writing and uh, working on that craft and focusing on, uh, on the craft of songwriting, which was very valuable for me. If you could say, and if you're comfortable saying, what like volume of songs do they require in something like that? Uh, it varies uh, pretty wildly. Uh, with mine, it was 12 songs a year. Okay. Uh, 12 100% uh, written songs. If I co-wrote it with another person, it would be 24, if you know what I mean. So 1,200% yeah. song. Uh, and there was no... Uh, some contracts say that you have to have a certain amount of cuts a year. Uh, this one did not say anything about that. It was just turn in these songs and uh, we'll pay you a stipend and we'll kind of hook you up with other writers. And it, it was sort of a, it was a very lucky time. I don't, I don't know if there's a lot of those kind of deals remaining still, certainly not in Los Angeles, maybe in Nashville. But. No, not at, it'd be about like 12 songs a month. Maybe. Yeah. <laughs> Seriously. Probably. No, I'm serious. And, and it's not, I'm sure it's not, uh, compensation is not what your compensation was at Warner Chapel back in the day, for sure. It was, it was decent. It really paid, paid bills. It allowed me to do what I needed and wanted to do. And I was touring with Henley at the same time, off and on. So those were, those were good days of bills being taken care of and not having to worry about it as much so I could focus on my craft. And that, you know, that's lucky. That's yeah. really lucky. 
expect to, to have that. Well, I, I think everybody now is pretty much of the mindset that they're cool with the way things are, but they've also accepted that, okay, I've got to have a plan B and probably C, D, and maybe E as well and, and not rely on one. True. You, you can't. You have to have other streams. You have to have other ways of spending your time and using your skill. Um, songwriting is great, but the numbers have really changed for mm-hmm. publishing and what you would generate uh, from having a song cut. There's no mechanical royalties anymore to speak of, really. What, what does that mean, mechanical royalties? Mechanical royalties meaning um, you get paid a certain – percentage of each record or each CD or each cassette okay. that's sold that's actually created in a factory and then sold. So this, uh, it's a mechanical piece of something that you put into a machine and listen to the song. So now we don't have that stream. And that was significant. Yeah. When I did the song for Don Henley and for Stevie Nicks, that was a significant amount of dough that came from the sales of actual CDs. Uh, so that that stream is gone, and it's just hard to really track. You know, there you can have many tens of thousands of performances of your song and only generate pennies. It seems yeah. in certain, certain markets, and so it's harder uh, unless you get just gigantic mega hits happening, and you're producing a bunch of records. I suppose you could make a great living, but for the vast majority of writers, it's become more difficult to make a living just from writing. Yeah, it was interesting. I had a, a guest on a while ago, young, young, younger person and, and very nice. And, but he's a kid, you know, and he said, make sure you tell everybody that I have, you know, X number of streams. And I'm like, man, that's like a quart of milk. If you're lucky, why would I tell people, <laughs> you know, it's <laughs> like, what are you going to, you're going you know, to buy the paper Sunday and maybe be able to go to a movie with that, you know? And it's, it's, it's just the reality of what it's like is what you said. Yeah, yeah. It's crazy. It's crazy. But I am lucky that I, I get to tour and generate an income with my skill as a player. That That is still uh, pr- pretty much in place, although those numbers have changed too. But I, I'm lucky that I've done some um, fairly high-level gigs and yeah. continuing to do a gig that pays me well and we do some nice traveling. And uh, so that's that's a great stream right there. Um but photography as well has been and is becoming more and more. The last couple of years, I've actually been selling more prints and doing more commission work for collectors. And that's been great as well. Um, like, what do you, what do you, what do you, like, first of all, let me just tell people um, Timothy's got, he's a really good photographer. I mean, I, I'm, I like, I'm a photography hobbyist i like taking pictures street photography mostly but go to his website at timothy drury it's timothy and drury is d-r-u-r-y.com he's got some really interesting nice stuff on there actually timothy drury is the is the place to go timothy drury might not even be active right now to be honest i think it's timothy drury yes it's right timothy drury music right so I, yes. I had I I just you know what I just entered Timothy Drury and it, the thing came up I didn't realize yeah it's Timothy Drury oh, yeah. music sorry about that thanks for no no that. problem no problem so how does that work when you're like how does that work making money with photography <laughs> well any way you can make it happen is, I hear that man <laughs> so you do it, but, you know what I've done over the years is I've done a series of, of gallery shows. Um, and I've done group shows where I've shown a few of my pieces, but I, I've done uh, one man gallery shows where I'll have an opening at a really nice art gallery and I'll play music at the opening and I'll show a bunch of my, my prints. And I have some very large, you know, five feet by eight feet kind of prints and mm-hmm. small prints and prints that I've made myself in the dark room over the years and other prints that really uh, well-known printers have made and, and so you uh, you try to generate interest that way, and I've sold quite a few pieces that way. And then, then there's sort of a word of mouth that happens with the collector, and people will go to their home and see my work on the wall, and they'll go, wow, who, who did that? And can I get him to do some work for my home? So that's, that's what's been uh, happening the last couple of years. I've had a few people – uh, really respond to my work and that's led to other commissions and, and if you can get like a private commission 
with a collector, then you can negotiate a certain amount of dough to create some pieces, you know? Mm. And, and at this point in my career, I'm able to ask for a decent amount of dough for making these prints happen and making sure that they're mounted and hung properly and all that kind of stuff. So it, uh, it turns into a nice little stream of, of revenue for me. And I've got a lot of inventory because I've been shooting for decades and, uh, spent a lot of time in the dark room back in the day and have so many prints boxes filled with prints. So there's, there's some, some life left in these prints as, um, as a commodity and not to make it sound like, you know, that, that it's about that, but, but it is nice to have some, but why have to, sh- why have to reinvent the wheel if you got it sitting on your shelf? Yeah, I don't sure. think that's that's no different than you have a song that you wrote that didn't get published, and someone comes to you and says, "Hey, I want to, I need a song that sounds like this." What are you supposed to do? Write a new one when you have it on your hard drive? No, I don't think there's any. Absolutely, man. You know, Absolutely. I think that's called smart. You know. <laughs> well, I guess maybe I'm smart then. I don't know, but I'm happy about it, and yeah. uh, and it, and it's really cool because. You know, some days I feel like shooting pictures and working on images more than I feel like playing. And then other days, vice versa, right? I like to play more. So uh, those two pursuits get to feed each other in a way. Like I can take a break from playing but still be creative with imagery. And then I really want to come back and record and play music too uh, after that. So I, I feel very lucky that I have a couple of outlets uh, a couple of strong outlets for me to express myself. I uh, think that's awesome, man. Yeah, I think it's totally. And I and I, I'm going just for the listeners. The reason I'm going a little far afield from Timothy's music, which we'll get back to in a second, is because half the audience, or at least half my audience, is musicians. And I think it's important to the com- for the community of musicians to kind of let other people know what's going on how how are people even at the high professional level like timothy how are these guys making money you know because oh the, i interviewed a guy in nashville a very good uh, touring guitarist actually he's a music director on billy ray cyrus and he said craig the hustle's always on and and I've found that to be true with like, you know, 90% of the musicians I interview. And if it's true for so many, I think it, I like to kind of share what everybody's doing to, to either have a side hustle or a legit second career. And, you know, it's no different than being a, fi- you know, most guys I work out in the gym, there's loads of firefighters there. They all have side hustles and their businesses, some of them, you know, so. Right on. No, you got to, man. Yeah, to. absolutely. How'd you get involved with John Anderson on the opera project? Oh, wow. Well, that was so funny. I, I was uh, uh, hired or recruited by um, this lady years ago who was putting on this event in California, in, uh, in the Southern California wine country or San Luis Obispo kind of wine country. She was doing these events every couple of months uh, called the winery, the, the music and wine event uh, Something like that. I'm forgetting the exact name. Oh, my God. But um, it was this event where uh, bands would show up at a winery and play for this panel of judges. Uh, And I was one of the judges on a few of these events. And so was John Anderson at one of these events. Uh, And so we met and started talking about music and writing. And I asked if I could send him some of my material, which I did. And uh, two or three days later, I got an email back from him with some MP3s of him singing over the top of the tracks that I sent. Wow, that's pretty cool. Yeah, it was really immediate. And it was really like clear that he, he... Something was resonating with him about this work that I sent him, and it was fairly orchestral, complex stuff, kind of intense orchestral stuff. And uh, to hear his voice, I'm a huge Yes fan. It was the first concert I ever saw when I was a kid was Yes. Mm. and i have seen them many, many times and listened to all their records and was very influenced by them and that kind of writing, that kind of progressive music. But his voice especially is so iconic. So to hear his voice 
over the top of something that I created and produced was a, a thrill, a, a, a thrill to me. So he had had a, an idea for a political drama opera kind of uh, story and so that's that's what we started working on, but it's evolved into something else at this point. It, and and neither one of us really knows what that is. But um, we will finish this project at some point, and it will either be an opera or a play or a record or a series of, of uh, musical orchestral vignettes. I'm not really sure, but I'm not trying to to force it or control it so much. And he's been very busy the last few years uh, with various tours he's been involved in. So it's been hard for us to spend a lot of time working on it in the last few years. Um, but those tracks exist and I play them from time to time just to remind myself how cool and how lucky that, that is and was. That's awesome. And, and kudos to you for, you know, a lot of times, you know, we had a conversation earlier. A lot of musicians are very awkward with promote. You know, they feel awkward self promoting, but you didn't, and you got a potential thing going with John Anderson. And all you did was say, hey, "Can I send you some of my music?" You know, yeah. in marketing, they call that permission based marketing. And you know, that's a, it's like signing someone up to your list versus having them go to your website and sign up yourself. Nobody, I mean, I hate when people. I'm a marketer, and I hate when people sign me up for this. But if they ask me, or if I go to their website, yeah, sure, man, I sign up. It's you know, you have my own free will. It's cool. <laughs> yeah, but, no, I, I, yeah. I felt strongly about it. That's when it's easier for me to self promote. I, I, in general, I find self promotion a little. I distasteful or I feel embarrassed or a lot of people feel like, why I don't deserve to be, you know, whatever the reason may be. But if I feel really strongly about the work and I did about these particular songs, then I feel so much more confident. And what's the worst that he can do is like, Oh, no, thanks. I don't do that. Or, or he doesn't respond, but I have no problem at that point going, Hey man, you should, Take a listen to this. I really, really like it. I really feel strongly about it, and I would love to send it to you. Right. Or, or even if he said, hell no. Okay, thanks for your time. You know, like, what's the worst? I could literally, there's nothing, there's zero downside to this outside of, you know, your feelings are hurt for 15 minutes. <laughs> but if you're in sales, you, don't, you, you know, like, yeah. that's just another no. It's like, you know, oh, that's my, I'm closer to my next yes, you know? Yeah, you got to get a little tougher in this business for sure. In the music business mm. there, you know, it kind of uh, promotes a, a little a toughening, you know, cause there's so many no's so many, so many like negative responses to things, but luck has a big part of it as well. Yes. Timing and, 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 you know, being, a, yeah, I, I think so. Right place at the right time, but being prepared or having a great skill or having a really terrific song, something that's undeniably, high quality and good and, and, uh, fully realized, you know, then that's strong. That's really strong, but you can't take it personally. If people are, don't want to hear your music or don't respond. I, I find that people have gotten a little looser about responses and, and just, um, like me, for instance, it took me a long time to respond to you to even do this, this interview, not because I didn't want to do it, but a lot of stuff, comes up there's so much data there's so much noise right yeah. now with the computer texting emails instagram facebook whatever it is social media and then creating then it's 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 hard sometimes and i fall prey to that too but i think people have just gotten a little more rude or a little less caring about how they impact no around them. <laughs> no I, I, surely I you jest I really feel that. And it's, it's kind of, I sound like an old guy when I say that, but true. It's true <laughs> it sound like, but it's true, man. But you know what? Like I, I, I know I'm not the center of the universe. So if someone doesn't answer me, I, I don't, you know, I'll try again and maybe once in a while I'll try a third time and that's it. And if it, it I, it's okay for someone to say, no, I don't, I don't want to say I don't care. I mean, and you know, it's, I, I, I don't care in the context of, I know it's got nothing to do with me it has nothing to do with me or maybe it does. And that's okay too. I mean, I don't expect everybody to like me or like this show or, you know, whatever. And I don't know. It's again, because I've been in sales for, 
20 years plus, it, I don't really take anything personal and I know everybody's busy and I have not, I've had one rude person to deal with since wow. I've been doing this show. That's lucky. One rude person. That is <laughs> phenomenal. Man. I never yeah. had those kind of results in like raw business meetings. Oh so, yeah. Uh, so I had like that's a very good asshole ratio, I think. <laughs> it's been like yeah. 1 in 200 or probably no, I've got a very different ratio. <laughs> yeah, well, if I was pitching music, I'm sure it would be a little higher, a lot higher. <laughs> I've met some real pieces of work, and I'm some of them might have the same thing to say about me. I, I would imagine. It, it, but. Well, it's just you know, it's just whatever you know. I I, just, I I don't let that stuff bother me. You know, as long as I can go home and kiss my wife, and you know, my kids are okay with me. And most oh, of, most of the you. time, they are. I'm, <laughs> That's the important thing, right? Life and kids and relationships. Yeah, and relationships things. are important to me. You know, my friends. Love, are, yeah, you know, friends and love and hanging out with your people and yeah, that's the big. That's the main thing. I mean, we're you know, being an artist is great and all, but you got to you know, put it in perspective too. Yeah. Although art and the things that artists create are a fundamental part of a of a decent, well lived life. Right. So yeah. it's it's important. And I get that. I just don't I just want to be realistic about it, too. I'm, I feel very lucky. I know I'm getting kind of philosophical now, but I, just, right. I feel really lucky to be able to create things for myself and also things that other people respond to and, and makes them feel. Uh, I don't know, makes them feel something deep or something meditative or something that takes them away from the mundane nature of just living a life, you know, or work or shopping or cleaning the house or whatever it is. So I think artists do have a special kind of magic and, 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 and should maybe be, um, be talked about maybe, maybe it is worth investigating what's going on with artists and why they create. And, uh, I think everybody could create if they really wanted to really decided to. Yeah, I agree with that for sure. You, you know, know, one thing that's nice for me and not, this is about you, not me, but you mentioned about being grateful. It's everybody I speak to is feels that way. Like all the, the, all of you guys that I interview with rare exception. I mean, like I can't think of anybody, like I said, I had that one asshole, but he was anyway. Um, everybody is really, and I am very humbled by that. And that has helped not help me in the way of like being more open, if that makes sense. Cause you're always dealing with people who are just very humble and it's, it, you know, it's helped me to be honest with you. Oh, no, that's great. Yeah. Well, then that's that's you. You're you've been inspired. By I that. have. I you know how much I'm saving on therapy. <laughs> yeah, man. Absolutely, it's a good conversation. Is worth a lot of therapy. Bro. Oh hell yeah! Hey, l let me ask you. Uh, you've worked with some pretty iconic artists, and I was curious if you could tell me about for each one of these folks how you got the gig and the nature of, of the engagement and, and a cool or interesting story about working with them. So let's start with Don Henley, which is where I guess you, you first hit big. Yeah. Don Henley was my first tour ever. Um, and it was for the end of the innocence record, which is a big hit record for him. And it was 1989 and, I was living in Los Angeles, but I was really thinking about moving back to Sacramento. Late 80s, I wasn't, wasn't really thriving the way I expected to be thriving and wasn't getting the gigs that I was auditioning for. So I was on the verge of just moving back home to Sacramento and, uh, and doing Lord knows what, but uh, something other than music, possibly. But it was during that time that I, I uh, found out from a friend of mine who had auditioned to play guitar in Henley's band. He found out that they were still looking for a, a piano player, keyboard player, piano player, singer. And so I got the number of the tour manager 
and called him like every day for about a month, you know, and, and tried not to be obnoxious. I guess it was hard not to be obnoxious doing that, but I was just very tenacious about it and, and uh, urged them to give me a chance to come and play because I was like the perfect guy for the job and blah, blah, blah. And I was playing piano really, really well at the time. I had been playing a lot. Uh, so I felt confident about that. They finally gave me uh, a slot to come in and audition. Now, hold, hold on a second. Did you have a name? Like you just called the guy. Did he? Did, and you weren't able to say, well, I've played with this person or I've played with that. It was just really like, hey, I my buddy told me about this and I'm the right guy. <laughs> yeah. I mean, I had. Good for you, no man. I had no credits. I played top 40 gigs. You know, I had original bands, that sort of thing. But there was no touring experience at all, like none, zero. So that's uh, awesome. I had to just go in with my elbows flying like, come on, man, you've got to give me a chance. You know, it was like an old Hollywood movie about Great. making it big or whatever. And so uh, they said, OK, OK, stop calling. Yes, we'll see. <laughs> so I. I went down to the rehearsal studio and actually met Don Henley briefly. And uh, he gave me a cassette and there were three songs. It was Sunset Grill, End of the Innocence and New York Minute, all piano songs uh, where the piano is really featured. Mm -hmm. And he, he said, so uh, can you come in tomorrow and play these? And I went, wow, it'd be great if I had a couple of days, you know, I <laughs> It was like a Friday and, and I wanted to come back fresh on Monday. Sure. And Henley looked at me like, what? Like, what do you mean? But he but he also kind of appreciated that I wanted to be very conscientious about it and really learn the material mm. because and I was to find this out as the years went on, Don Henley and all the Eagles, really, they're really into like play this exactly the way we recorded it. Okay. I mean, they want you to be prepared. They really want you to know the material. So, uh, so he liked that. It, it kind of, maybe it was annoying, but it, he, he liked that. I was, I was that interested in being really good with it. So I came back on Monday and I had played those three songs 14 hours a day, you know, on that weekend and just got really familiar with them and played the three songs with the rest of the band assembled. He had everybody but the piano player. So uh, sat down, played, played well, uh, I thought. And Henley was singing, and he would kind of turn around and wouldn't say much, but he'd kind of like nod his head like, yeah, okay, that was cool. And so got through the three songs. I shook their hands and said bye, thanks, and left and didn't hear anything for about a week. And then got a call back to go in a second time, played the same three songs, same way, same reaction. It was like Groundhog's Day kind of thing. And uh, waved, okay, thanks again. I'll see you again, right? Ha ha. And made a joke of it. And, you know, didn't hear anything for another 10 days or so. And they finally called back for a third call back. And that was the day that they actually said, okay, you're the guy. And that day happened to be my birthday. Oh, cool. July 5th, 1989 is when I actually did that audition and got the gig. That is a true story. So that, that changed my, my entire life changed profoundly like overnight. Good for uh, you. What a great, that's an, yeah, that's an awesome that, story. Weird that, that they had three callbacks. <laughs> no, not for them, because they really they go, well, what about that guy? Well, I don't know. Well, what about that guy? Well, he's got these kind of thing. Well, well we might need to see him again. They don't they, they really when I say they, I, I, I guess I'm referring to Don Enley, but that the kind of Eagles approach. Yeah, they really perfect things. They take time to decide, make decisions, you know, and to really good effect, I, I guess, considering their their writing and their success and whatnot. But, um, yeah, they took the time. I guess he, he had narrowed it down to a couple of different people that he liked. He'd seen 30 or 40 keyboard players. Wow. 
And I mean, that's more like a guitar cattle call. I wouldn't expect that many keyboard players. Wow. It's I, I know. It's usually pretty rare. But for a gig like that, I guess everybody was coming out of the woodwork. So he, uh, I don't know, maybe it wasn't 40, but a lot. He, he saw a lot of keyboard players. Do you think the fact that you're a California native, well, you, I know you say you were born in New York, but do you think the fact that you lived? No, I was born in Los Angeles. Oh, you, okay, father, your dad was. Oh, your dad was. Yeah. Uh -huh. uh, I was born in Los Angeles and, and was living there at, at the time. I live in the Bay Area now. Uh, do you think that so. helped you? <sighs> what, in that particular instance, you mean? Yeah, in that yeah. Audition? I don't, I don't know. Uh, maybe. Possibly, just out of convenience sake, you know, uh, they didn't have to fly me from another city, I guess. Yeah, maybe, maybe, maybe so. Well, no, I meant like emotionally. Like, do you know, uh, I, I interviewed uh, Bob Seeger's keyboard player. His name is Moose Brown. I don't know if you know him. He's out of Nashville, and he, he actually co-wrote It's Five O'Clock Somewhere. I don't know if you know him. Yeah, sure, sure. He auditioned for Seeger. And when Seeger found, he was born in Detroit. He grew up, uh, I don't, off the top of my head, nowhere, but it was in a rural area. But he was originally born in Detroit. And it was like once Seeger heard that, it was like, yeah, man, that's good. You're, we, you're the guy. <laughs> you know, I, I see what you're saying. I mean, the Eagles are decidedly a California band. So, right. yeah, uh, sure. That that may have made a, a difference difference to him. Yeah, just no, curious if there's. I've thought about that before. That's, that's interesting. I mean, I'm a California guy i've lived in california my entire life um i gotta say i'm enjoying northern california a, a bit more than southern california yeah um i miss some friends down there but just just ionically and visually i like it up here a lot a lot better yeah you know, i think as you get older like i i met a guitar player last week and he's from the bronx he grew up like three miles or five miles from me and it was an instant connection just because, oh, wow. because we had that, it was instant, and like we had nothing in common <laughs> besides that. But the, I mean, I shouldn't say nothing. We had some stuff in common, but you know that was the primary thing. So it was like you know, boom. Anyway, um, well, you know, I, I, not to interrupt, but no, uh, no. there's another story about Henley that may be of interest to your listeners yeah. because it's it's kind of a guitar centric um, story. Uh, I play the guitar as well. And I, I, I play pretty well, but I don't play like a guitar player. I, I, uh, I don't even know what that means. Like maybe some of my fingerings or my approach to melody on a guitar is different than a schooled guitar player. Mm -hmm. um, and I, I really enjoyed writing songs on the guitar because it's a little fresher for me because I, more, more accidents are available to me because I don't play the guitar as well as I do the piano. Okay. So the song that I co-wrote uh, with Henley, Everything is Different Now, the demo that I created at home had me playing the guitars, including the guitar solo. Oh, and wow. Henley really, really got into that track and wrote the lyrics and the melody to that track. So he was really married to that solo as well. He really got used to it and was very familiar to him. So when the time came to record the song for real on the record, he had Mike Campbell come in to play ostensibly to play the guitar parts and the guitar solo on this tune. And we all know that Mike Campbell is a genius guitar player, right? But, you know, so Henley wanted him to play my solo essentially and i maybe that was that's pretty funny that's hard for for another guitar player so he tried it a few times and i could see mike campbell was getting a little frustrated and he finally just kind of said why don't you get the guy who played it on the track man to do it and kind of stormed out really wow uh, to be frank and I didn't. I didn't hold it against him, but it was like, "Oh, very nice to meet you, Mr. Campbell. Okay, goodbye. See you." And so, so Henley looked at me and went, "Well, you want to give it a go?" And I said, "Yeah, man, I did it on the on the demo. Let's let's try it." So you played the guitar solo on that song as well. So I played the guitar solo on a really beautiful '57 Stratocaster, and and it, it was a real stratty kind of solo and um 
did a few passes and Henley was behind the glass producing me doing the guitar solo on this tune. And it was a thrill. It was unbelievable. And Henley was very generous and very nice to me during that process. And, uh, that is something I will, I will never forget. Um, but anyway, so yeah, I wound up doing the solo that Mike Campbell couldn't or refused to do on that song. So Interesting. There. <laughs> Interesting. So how, was that your Strat, the 57 Strat, you said? No, I think it was Stan Lynch. Uh, he was producing, co-producing that record with Henley. I think it was his guitar, I Go. believe. Talk about Felder. How'd you get the gig with Don Felder? And I'm sure, I don't know, my gut tells me it wasn't a referral from Don Henley. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> No, but because I had been playing with Don Henley for many years, uh, when the Hell Freezes Over tour was getting put together, Henley wanted some of his guys from his band to be involved in that. So he called me and asked if I wanted to do that. And of course I did. And um, so did the Hell Freezes Over tour. That's when I met Joe Walsh. That's when I met Don Felder. And Felder and I just you know, became friends, started writing things together around 1999, 2000, you know, we started exchanging some ideas and we started writing some music for television together and some cues, uh, for, for a film reel. And, um, we're really spending a lot of time creating stuff together. So that's what really, you know, brought us closer together as, as pals. Um, but this is 2000. That's 11 years after you started working with Don. So you, when you met, you guys must have stayed in touch periodically then. Yeah. Okay. Well, I mean, we, well, the first time we met was 1994 because that's when the Hell Freezes Over tour started. So I met Don Felder on that tour. So 90, I've known him since 1994. But we started writing about – it was about 2000, I guess. Yeah, yeah that's, that's, cool. that's what I'm saying. You must, you must have – because that tour didn't last that you know six years, no? No, it was like, well, through 2000. I mean, oh, the last it was. Okay. The Eagles, it's the Millennium Concert at Staples Center. Okay. You know? So, but it was really 94, 95, 96 was when it was really going gotcha. full swing. And then there was a few gigs in between that and 2000. And then I started working with Don. Don wasn't in the Eagles anymore, and neither was I. And so he and I started creating and writing stuff together. And, um, uh, then he put together his solo touring band around 2005, 2006, I guess. And so I've been doing gigs with him. That's like 12 years now. That's a long time. Real long. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Lots of touring, lots of travel with him, lots of playing and recording. I, I co-wrote, I think, nine songs on his last record that he released in 2013. Very cool, man. Yeah. And, and how about Joe? Hmm. Well, Walsh, same thing. I met him during uh, the Hell Freezes Over tour. So when he was putting his solo thing together in 97, uh, I did a couple of years with him as, as a second keyboard player in his band. He had two drummers, two keyboard players, background singer, bass player, another guitar player. Kind of a big band. Yeah, it was a big band. Yeah, it was fun. Great fun working with Joe. He's a great entertainer, and uh, he's just loose and fearless, you know, as a, as a performer. Great guitar player, of course, but he's yeah. just – he has a lot of fun doing it. Whereas with the Eagles, maybe it's a little more serious, a little bit tighter of a ship, I guess, is one way of putting it. Hmm. But um, but Joe would uh, do his own thing. It would be much more kind of loose, fun – he didn't mind if accidents happened, you know, which was great. It was refreshing. Well, he was a solo artist before he was with, you know, he was with the James Gang. Then he had his own thing with um, Barnstorm where he sort of ran the show. And that was a wild time, I would imagine, in his life for what was going on. So I'm not surprised he's, you know, looser. He was a musician you know, I don't know the other guys' histories and how far back they go, but Joe was, you know, successful at a, a long, young age and doing a lot of stuff, you know. Uh, and he's also a real, I know he's a very talented guy. Like, if you listen to any of the 
any of the uh, the early James Gang albums, he's not just playing electric. He wrote the songs. He's playing acoustic guitar. He's playing playing banjo. He's playing piano. I mean, he's he's yeah. doing a lot of stuff. He's a super talented guy. He I, is. I love his playing. Yeah, me too. And now White Snake, you've been with them <laughs> for nine years. Had you? That's a totally different crew. That was off on a total, totally different side of of my resume. Um, I was with them. It was really about seven years that I was with them. It was 2003 that I started with them. December 2003, January, somewhere in there. Um, uh, a friend of mine, keyboard player, friend of mine had played with white snake and was not able to do the tour that they were gearing up for in 2003. So he recommended me. That was definitely a recommendation. Gave David Coverdale my number. Coverdale called me and I was visiting my friend uh, in San Jose at that point. I wasn't living in San Jose yet, but I, I was visiting and got, got the call from Coverdale chatted with him for a while, actually played the piano, you know, just set the phone on the piano and started just playing stream of consciousness on my friend's piano in San Jose. And, and, uh, he, he went for it. He went, okay, you're the guy. So it was as simple as that. That's um, did you, so, by that point, sorry, let me, let me cut you off. I was curious by that point in time, had you been around enough guys that, Oh, it's David Coverdale. No big deal. Like you, it was more like a just you're in the business mode of okay, it's a guy calling me to talk about music or something like that. Well, yeah, I mean, I've met a lot of people throughout my entire life. I mean, mm -hmm. my father, my father was a famous television actor, so I got to meet. I met Jimmy Stewart for God's sake. I mean, when I was younger, you know. So I'm not trying to brag. I'm just like, yeah. After a while, it's like you meet these incredibly famous iconic people and um it it still affects me a, a, a bit for sure some more than others but with coverdale um i i had the confidence of being uh, a touring musician and i had done the tour with the eagles and and with some fairly well-known people so it wasn't i wasn't that starstruck except i was a huge deep purple fan so right. that that fact made me a little bit uh not nervous i was just yeah I, I was really like wow this is david coverdale this is this is amazing plus he's got the biggest boomiest london accent thing going on mm -hmm. uh even he's from the north but you know <laughs> he speaks more like a londoner at times and uh is just a great a great voice so it's a it's a fun phone experience with david coverdale for sure. Um, That's interesting what you just said, because it's a dramatically different accent being from up north there. Yeah. Yeah. Well, he's he's from from the north, but he spent a lot of time in London and sort of, you know, kind of there's a poshness at times to his incredible voice. You gotcha. know, and it's just really, he's, he's great. I'm not making fun at all. And I would hope that he would laugh if he heard this. But um but he's just such, just such a great voice and a great front man and just the stereotypical rock front man of all time. He's just so, so great. Um, great singer. So I, I had a lot of fun working with White Snake. Um, and it, it was a similar kind of thing emotionally because working with the Eagles and, and Henley is great and wonderful, but it's it's a little confining it at times to be honest uh in terms of uh, what you can play and how you play it and what sounds you use and just the whole the decorum of things at all times seems to be very important um white snake was just much much more pure fun just much more fun uh um sweatier more fun more kind of just muscular hard rock music you know so you could dig in in a way <laughs> that there just wasn't an opportunity to do in the context of an eagle show uh, there's not a lot of blazing keyboard moments in an eagle show okay so yeah. 
With White Snake, I got to do organ solos, you know, deep purple songs and White yeah. Snake, and really just like make sound happen and sing really hard and loud. And there's there's something something really satisfying um, about that, physically satisfying in a way that that some bands aren't, you know. So I, I cherished that time with with White Snake and traveled to places I never went with the Eagles. Um, That's went to interesting. Russia, all over South America, Russia, uh, went back to Australia, New Zealand, uh, like every country in Europe, Iceland, uh, boy, just about everywhere. Uh, so that was fun too, which fed into my photography because I was always shooting on the days off. Oh yeah, that's right. Opportunities to shoot all over the planet, which was great. What, who was the guitar player in White Snake when you were in the band? Well, they probably had two or three. They've had a lot of guitar two, players. Yeah, two guitar. Well, there's been a lot of musicians in that band in general. I think yeah. I was maybe the tenth keyboard player, about twelfth, fifteenth. I don't know. Yeah, but that's a big tenure, seven years. That you had. Yeah, that was a good long time to be with them, 2003 to 2010. Um, it was Doug Aldrich mm-hmm. and Red Beach were the guitar players. Right. Uh, when I was in that band, both of them just monsters, monsters, shredding, great rock guitar players. Different styles, but both really, really cool players. Man, Marco Mendoza was playing bass, and then it was Uriah Duffy playing bass. And let's what a see, name, I, Uriah Duffy! He sounds he, like he's like um, uh, culturally confused, like <laughs> right? It's like Uriah. Oh, it's, I don't know what that is, but Duffy sounds like an Irish name. But Uriah Duffy. Sounds, well, and he's 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 a brilliant bass player. He's also a, a Bay Area guy. He, I live closer to him now than I did before. Um, you should check him out. Uriah Duffy is is a, a very talented cat. Um, and was named after the band Uriah Heat. Right, so that's what I figured because, like, where else would you get that name? Yeah, right. Um, like, I've read the baby books, you know, that I never saw Uriah in there, I don't think. Yeah, I think it's a biblical name, perhaps. Who knows? Could but um, uh, anyway, yeah, so uh, Uriah played bass. I played uh, with Tommy Aldridge. He played drums, and Chris Frazier played drums for a while in that band. So great players uh, and great great fun in that band. It sounds like a very fun, cool experience, man. You mentioned your dad a few minutes ago. He was a successful actor, James Drury, and you could tell the listeners after I finish this, you know, where he, you know, what his uh, his marquee mm-hmm. roles is or was. Uh, did this? I would imagine this made your childhood a lot more interesting and unconventional. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. But maybe not for the reasons that you would uh, assume. I never really lived with my father full time because my parents were divorced when I was very, very young. Okay. Um, and so I spent a lot of time with him, but it would be vacations and weekends and the typical, uh, you know, a uh, divorced parent kind of setup with the sure. kids. Um, so, uh, sure. I mean, he was, a, he was an influence seeing, seeing him on the set doing his show and seeing people react to him as a star was informative and interesting in a way kind of sent me the other direction, like not wanting to have that kind of attention. I've yeah. always been, more retiring and less wanting to be in the spotlight, ironically. But I'm a keyboard player, so I'm typically behind a big pile of furniture. You know what I mean? So you can be on a stage, huge stage, in front of many tens of thousands of people and still feel kind of safe and protected in a way. Yeah, totally. But it felt kind of dangerous to have that many people coming at you with wanting an autograph or a piece of you. And, and he was a, a big, big TV star. He had a show called the Virginian in the sixties. He was the star of the Virginian James Drury as the Virginian. And they're playing it a lot more now. I, I see it on television a lot more being rerun. Uh, is that funny fun. when you see it? Yeah. I mean, it's great. It's like, that's my dad, but I, I'm kind of separate from it. I can watch it and enjoy the show. It was a really terrific show, a 90 minute Western on NBC. Very unusual 90 minute that show. Is 
Um, but yeah, it's, it's my dad. I mean, when I'm on tour and we're watching stuff on the bus, it'll come on sometimes and I'll go, Hey man, that's, that's my pop. And so it's kind of a hoot and, uh, he's still alive and, uh, which is great. He's still kicking. Where does he live now? Uh, he lives in Houston, Texas. He's been there for many years. Hmm. I don't see him that often, but I talk to him from time to time. And, um, but yeah, it was a, it was a very, very interesting childhood. A lot of back and forth between mom and dad. And they were both very different. And then my father's fame was an interesting kind of thing, element. And, um, I don't know ultimately what it's done, how it's affected me, but it's in there. I mean, it, it informed my early years in a profound way. Um, well, I think what you said, I mean, you can, you always, whenever you have an extreme as a, as a parent, that's, you know, kids can go two ways. They become just like that, or they say, mm, fuck this. It's not for me. And they go out of their way to make sure they're not like that, or they're not, that's not their life. Right. You know, so right. that's how, you know, it sounds like you were like, you know what, that's not my thing. Well, I, yeah, I, I, I was sort of shy and not really into the, to the spotlight element of it, but there was something intriguing about, uh, having people know you for something or know about what you do. And, and that became me playing the piano because I started playing when I was five years old. And by the time I was 10 or 11, I was writing my own songs, starting to write my own songs and got really good. I mean, at a young age, I was a decent piano player, decent keyboard player. That's very cool. And that was something that I felt more confident about. Like, yeah, people should hear this. People, people should know about this, of course, because I'm playing really well, you know, but, it, but it was never about wanting to be famous or be on a magazine cover or that sort of thing. I just wanted to do really good work that people would appreciate because it was so good you know that was always my Interesting. thing so i'm wondering and i'm sorry I, I definitely am not playing armchair therapist but I, i'm on for you because god knows i'm not qualified for that but i'm i always try to figure out you know how to connect the background dots i'm wondering if i would imagine being in your dad's position that much of his attention that he was given was because of where he was, not what he was do the quality of his work or, and I'm not taking anything away from the quality of his work, obviously, but For you sure. know, it's, it's uh, people that are starstruck are pretty like fickle. It's like, you know, Oh, he's a, a star. I mean, that's why, I mean, shit, you just, all you have to do is watch the housewives of X, you know, fill in the blank. They're not, you're, <laughs> you know, you're not watching that because, <laughs> shit this is tremendous performance i mean you're it's you know just the, the fascination the curiosity right and, sure. I, and i think television and i think acting and and you know television celebrities like that in general and maybe sure. you went said you know i like this but i don't like that you know because you're very pure with your like wor work at your not your work ethic um you're very pure with the integrity of the art you're doing like oh, you could tell that's like really an, an integral part of your being is like you know I, I i it's about the photo that you're taking it it's not like oh shit i gotta get some bunch of pictures like i've looked at your photos and you know you could tell that that's not like random like like me when i'm walking down the street i'm like oh man that dude looks like he'd be really good in the picture i take it but I'm, you're like you know, there's a whole thing going on with you when you're doing stuff uh, as to the artistic component. Well, I, maybe so. I think I think you might be right, but I don't think of it too much when I'm doing it. It just sort of happens that way. But but yeah, um, yeah, excellence has always been a, a thing for me. Whatever I'm doing or yeah. trying to do, try to do it just really, really well, hmm. and that requires a certain amount of focus, certain amount of patience. I think. Sure. I think a lot of really terrific art comes from just spending a little bit more time than maybe some other guy spent doing that thing. Let, let's let's spend a few more hours getting better at this. Yeah. People talk about 10,000 hours, you know, to get really great at something. I mean, 
50,000 hours. Do that. Do yeah. <laughs> I'm serious. I mean, let's, let's just really try to do something well, focus on it. And I certainly have done that with piano playing and turned out that photography was like that for me as well. I spent so many weeks in the dark room and trying to understand photography and what to, the choices I was making when I was shooting a picture and how to, how to compose something. And yeah, man, I've, I've always tried to do really, really good work and not, and not always succeeding for sure. You know, like, <laughs> well, Most. no, that's that's not possible. You can't always, you can't, yeah. go, you know, the Most best the athletes in the world, you know, but, you know, the conventional example, you know, the best baseball players in the world fail seven out of 10 times. Right. So, yeah, yeah that's amazing. It's amazing. But I think work ethic is like that. You either have it or you, it's like being pregnant. You know, you don't have a work ethic like, well, you know, let me do this really good, but I can do this kind of like half ass shitty. I don't, I, that's like my observation anyway. You yeah. Know, I think it's pretty yeah, consistent. It defines you or doesn't define you. Yeah. You know? yeah. I agree with that. What are, what, Timothy, what are some of the, like, what kind of obstacles did you have to overcome through this journey? Uh, either personal music related or business related because, you know, for one, it, you got your first major gig later in life comparatively. Yeah. Right. Yeah. I was like 20, eight years old, I guess, when that yeah. happened, 1989. Yeah. Not old by a long shot, but comparatively, and I, I think that took a lot of balls to call them up and, you know, convince them that you were the guy. Yeah, I guess it did. I, I guess it really, you know, I figured what, what do I have to lose at this point? And I play really well. So it'd be great to have an opportunity to use this to make a good living. Mm -hmm. So, so that, that fueled the fire um, of that. But I mean, obstacles, I, I would say just kind of learning, ugh, man, learning to not take things so personally. Uh, that's been a real long struggle. Sure. In this industry. Because uh, you're, working, you're working intimately with people, traveling with them, making music happen. But you're not supposed to take it personally it's really it's kind of it's it's hard at times because how do you not take things personally or if you've written a song with somebody uh how do you not get emotionally charged about the direction of the song or what happens afterward or you know the business of publishing and it can be kind of kind of tough at sure. times a little brutal and a little inhuman uh so that's been something i've had to really work hard to 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 get through i'm, I'm finally starting to be better about it as i get older uh and i'm not really i'm not really uh what's the word not well you were talking about hustle before I, I I do I do hustle for for opportunities and things that I really uh, want to work on and feel strongly about, but I'm not I don't have that crazy gnawing hunger to have to do another big gig like I did when I was in my 20s or 30s. Sure. What, what if I, you? Sorry. Good. Well, because I've I've done it and. And there's other things that I'm interested in pursuing in my life rather than just like, hey, where's the next gig, man? What are you doing? Uh, did you hear? I mean, who's auditioning? Okay, cool. Like, oh, all right. Well, uh, do you know where he lives? I mean, you know, I'm just this kind of this panic about having to work, which I understand. I'm not putting it down. It's just that's not where I'm at in my life right now. And I, I still have to work hard to make my living. Sure. Like sitting on a boat in the south of france smoking cigars though i would love to be which wouldn't be the worst thing in the world. <laughs> that, that, that would be dreamy but that would be you know independently wealthy yeah. uh, to a to a degree where you could just spend every day doing exactly what you want to do and i i'm i'm not that i do get to do what i really love to do most of the time um i don't know what my point is man i'm just not uh I'm not as, as panicked about 
all of it. And, and I'm doing my own shows now. That's the thing I hustle on now is my own work. Mm. Um, I've got a great gig with Don Felder and we travel and, and, uh, have a great time. Um, but, but the juice for me is, is promoting and working on my, my stuff. Now, my songs, my playing, my imagery, I'm putting it all together into this show that I do that we can talk about as well. But, um, so, so yeah, um, I'm getting, uh, I'm getting a little bit better about just calming down through this whole process of being an artist, you know, and, and it's not, it, it feels better, it feels a little bit more grown up, I guess. Is there any, first, thanks for sharing that. That was, um, I appreciate that, the, your honesty in that. Is there anything in particular, like, uh, for, for people that do take stuff personally, like a strategy or a particular coping skills or a frame, a way you framed it so that you were able to let go and not be so offended or not take things so personally? Um, focus more on what you're doing and what you, what you're responsible for, whatever that is, whatever you decide that is and, and make it less about, um, what that person, the other person is going through or yeah. what they're saying or what they're demanding or what they need or what their problem is or any of that, unless it really is, is your responsibility. And that's why there's some sort of issue. But, um, I, I, I just try to focus on what I can, what I can control in myself, hmm. uh, like how I react to things that I can control. What's going on around me uh, from day to day working with a bunch of people, uh, that's harder to control how that's going to go down. But how I react to things, I, I have more of a grasp on. And if I get frustrated or I'm starting to feel like, God, that was really mean what he said. I mean, why did he do that? Um, I just try to just try to play a song of my own or go uh, work on a picture or do do something for myself uh, where I can be responsible for, for that, you know, and control that moment more, if that makes any sense. Totally, man. Control the controllables and don't take on other people's shit. <laughs> yeah, it's not <laughs> it's easy to do, but that's what I at least Good for you, just, just like I go, no, nope, can't, I can't go there right now, uh, pal. Okay. Yeah. I, seem to be really worked up about something and that boy that was rude but okay i'm gonna go over here now and and do my thing you know good for you man you you mentioned that you were shy when you were a kid i think you said were you are you as an adult are you outgoing or shy by nature oh a lot less shy now as i'm older and a little more life experience behind me i i guess but there's moments where i get kind of i don't know if it's shy or just um, it's like, Hey, well, why are you asking me that question? Why? Who wants to know? <laughs> you know like, more like, well, which is funny that I'm sitting here talking to you doing an interview. It's, it, there is an opportunity to go, Hey, what the heck is yeah, going on? It, this is it. Me, like, <laughs> <laughs> well, it's funny. Cause a lot of people I'll talk to, they say they're shy and I'm like, Man, that surprised the shit out of me because we've been going on for an hour and a half about all this, <laughs> and 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 it's 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 not the same. Even though it's one on one, so it's a different context. Even though this is going to be aired, so I get it. Yeah, I get it. It's much easier to talk to someone that you might feel comfortable with. Even though I I, I have it, I have this thing I call it the um, the airplane effect. You ever sit next to somebody? on an airplane and for some reason you tell them your whole life story or they tell you, and yeah. it's because there's, you'll never see them again. There's no, you could be as vulnerable as you want because guess what? You don't even know where the fuck they live or what their last name is. 
Yeah, that's true. There's there's this anonymity that happens where you can just divulge, and and it's good because it feels good to talk. It, about. It's like cathartic. You can. It's like yeah. it's like yeah. a, an emotional shit you're just taking. And there's no downside. <laughs> you know, there's now you could talk about any. It's funny, man. I, I call it the airplane effect. It's it's no, that's it's, what this it's, is. It's the, the. I mean, you know, in a sense, sort of. Well, I enjoy it, and I enjoy yes. talking about my. My experiences with somebody who seems to be very interested and curious about it, that, very that curious. helps a lot. But yeah, there's times where, you know, like, I just don't feel like sharing, sharing things. Um, so I guess that's a, a form of shyness or protectiveness or, or uh, uh, whatever it might be. I, I, I don't know. It comes and goes with me. Mostly, I, I'm pretty comfortable in any room talking to anybody, yeah. uh, you know, and, and I'm not going to try to fool people that I, that I'm the smartest guy in the room or the most talented or any of that stuff. I just don't, I care a little bit less as time goes on about what, what people might be thinking yeah. about me. And when I was younger, I think I cared a lot about what every person was thinking about me. And do they like me? Oh no. Why did he smirk just now? He doesn't like me. You know, now it's like, I, I really can't be bothered as much. Uh, so that makes me less protective, less shy, less, uh, sure. I can say what I'm thinking right now and it's, and it's just fine. I don't have to worry about it, you know, but hopefully I won't sound like too much of an idiot to your, uh, to your listeners, maybe they'll find something that's interesting. About no, no. It. Well, I'm I'm the I'm the most simple of the lot, so you sound great to me. So <laughs> you'll be fine with everybody else. Trust me. Right. Hey, what what what's your uh, your non musical superpower? Non musical superpower? Oh, uh, she she was. Or in your case, let's say non artistic, because you're going to pull out like, well, I could, I feel, you know, I could tell if light is really appropriate to shoot, shoot a picture but let's, no I'm talking about non, non-career related really is better well I'm a terrific cook that's uh, right yeah that's cool you mentioned it how'd you, how'd you get into cooking that's definitely my mom and my grandmother growing up with two Greek women uh, they spent a lot of time making just magic happen in the kitchen and my grandmother wasn't so into having me in the kitchen, but my mom was really open to it and cool and tried to show me a lot of things that um, she was working on. So now as a result, as an adult, I can make some Greek delicacies uh, and uh, and just just that sense of sharing uh, food with your family and your friends. It's like a really big, it was always a big deal to my mom and my grandmother, to Greeks in general. They like, you know. You yeah. Know, they're very warm. They're inviting, engaging. They want to eat food and drink wine and laugh and stuff. So that makes that whole process really enjoyable for me, like cutting vegetables and sauteing and baking and cooking things, drinking wine and having people over. And then it fills the house with aroma. And it's this very atmospheric thing that, that happens. It, it is artistic. It's a lot like playing music, uh, actually. Well, creating but, creating that vibe that gives you the same good feelings that music does for sure, man. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It's 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 a good it's a good time. I like being in the kitchen. I really I do. I like cooking. And food always brings people closer too. You know, it's a, it's a, when someone asks you to eat with them, it's a real. I remember I I was you know when I first got into sales many many years ago I was studying as much as I can and several times I read if somebody invites you to eat or drink you know always say yeah because they're making them it means they're really comfortable with you they're making themselves a little vulnerable and so just say thank you yes yeah you know it is important it's a fundamental thing but you know you can really take it take it to uh to an extreme too. I mean, there's just so many great restaurants and, um, chefs. I'm really into chefs. If there's ever a, a, a program on TV or a movie about cooking or chefs, I'm always fascinated by it. And there's been some great ones too. Yeah. I don't know if you've seen, uh, burnt is a really, that's one of my favorite films I've seen in the last few years. Burnt B U R N T. Yeah. No, I'm going to have to check that out. 
Yeah, Bradley Cooper as a as a chef. I'm gonna watch it and write that down. It's it's really watching, and then uh, the movie Chef with John Favreau is. Uh, yeah, that one I did see where he's got his kid. Yeah, yeah, that they, was cool. Food truck. They yeah, got, <laughs> that was cool. That was a good. One. That was very, that was an unusual role for him too. Yeah, uh, I, I guess thought that so. was really cool. But I think I think he wrote and directed that as well. I guess he does all, everything he's in. He's always seems to be producing. Yes writing or directing that was a good movie i like that um what's a favorite part of what you do and the least favorite part of what you do oh man well the favorite favorite part of what i do is the catharsis and um, the meditation and feeling feeling good after playing for a few hours and you've forgotten any kind of uh you know, you, you've just forgotten the room. You're just, you're, you disappear into a beautiful meditative state. That's, that's my favorite thing about creating. Least favorite thing would be, uh, how, 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 what a torture that is at times, you know, when you're not really expressing what you're, what, what you're truly feeling, or if you're working on a picture and you're trying to filter it or work in the dark room and it's not really working out. It can be, it can be hard. It can be very frustrating. Um, and then the business part of it can be very frustrating as well. Uh, not my favorite part, really traveling in coach. is <laughs> One of my least favorite things that I have to do necessarily to go play gigs uh, I prefer being on a bus, on a bus tour. It's nice, but flying, uh, flying in coaches is, is just no fun anymore. It's just not really cool. Yeah, especially if you have to do it over and over and over again. Yeah, it becomes it becomes kind of a grind. But the time on stage is always a hoot, you know. It's always a gas. So, hey, I'm going to ask you uh, three more questions, and I really appreciate your time. Right on. Person who's had the biggest influence on your life. Wow, man, that's that's so hard. Probably my mother. It's it's family, you know, or my uncle John. My father's brother John was a writer, painter, actor, really brilliant, uh, funny, witty, clever man. And I spent quite a bit more time with him than my father when I was growing up. To be honest. Mm. Uh, quite quite a bit more. So I was I was very influenced by by him. But my mother was so sweet and loving, and uh, and always happy. Even though she didn't necessarily always have reason to be real happy every day, she she had a great attitude about life, and was very very sweet. <clears throat> I miss her very much, and. I, th I think genetically, you know, any kind of musical, uh, even though she wasn't a musician or, or a singer, she studied to be an actress. But there was just something genetically in her that I feel is is responsible for, for a lot of my uh, vision and my art uh, in my life. Uh, and she turned me on to a great number of fantastic films. Uh, and the soundtracks from different films. And um, so that has informed me so, so much in my work as a visual artist and uh, as a composer. It, it, she, she really, wow, man, she showed me so many great films. So That's fantastic. Yeah, it sounds like she was a huge influence on not just personally, but your career even. Yeah, well, just the course of my life. With a career I, path. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah, totally. That's fantastic. What's your definition of happiness? <laughs> Which is a really cliched kind of ho-hum question, but I know you're going to answer it like, you know, the the, <laughs> the deep, serious guy that you are. <laughs> oh, man, I don't know. I think... 
I think it's less deep and serious. Happiness is more of, it seems lighter. It's like when there isn't the big, deep, heavy, ominous, odious things going on. It's, it's just like, man, sitting on my deck and doing the New York Times crossword puzzle uh, in the afternoon, you know, drinking a scotch, <laughs> just sitting for a moment where you don't really have to do anything. You're just like, ah, oh, isn't this nice? This is really cool. Yeah. Just simple things. When you don't have responsibility, it's for, I don't know. I, 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 that's a happy time when you're like sort of like not in mentally preoccupied with some other shit you got to get done. Yeah, I think that's what I'm saying. I yeah, and, and I, because there's lots of responsibilities, and I love work, and I love spending all day in the studio and and um, and working really hard at things and taking care of stuff and you know managing my life and my house and business and all that stuff. It's it's great. But yeah, those moments where there's just nothing going on for an hour and you can just chill. Yeah, sitting outside with a scotch and cigar is like pretty, pretty. Yeah, yeah, I, I get it's, it, man. It's it's really, really nice. And I just got from uh, my girl uh, just got me a smoking jacket because she knows I like to smoke cigars. From there time you go, to time. man. She's like, you know, I I don't mind you smoking cigars, but we're gonna have to figure out how to. You know, you how to, win how to get the stink off you. <laughs> and, and she doesn't mind cigars so much, but just not in the house, right? Yeah. So she got me a smoking jacket, which I've started slowly using. And it's just the coolest, coolest sort of retro old school thing. And, and, and it works. And it kind of ties me to the past a little bit. So when I see like a movie from the 30s or 40s and I see – Men in smoking jackets with a snifter of uh, brandy there or something. Go. I can kind of be a part of that club, and I really, I really I enjoy it. Kind of silly, but I just No, enjoy. man, it's cool. It's totally cool. And now at least I know what we're going to do if you come to Florida. Oh, hell yeah. We're going to go for a cigar. <laughs> hell yeah. <laughs> Last question, man. And uh, I can't tell you. I uh, thank you so much for your time and, and uh, your, your uh, honesty. What's been the biggest change in your personality over the last 10 years? Well, I think we kind of hit on it before. Uh, just, you know, letting the, the grip loosen a little bit on uh, trying to control things. Um, being less worked up about each and every person's opinion of me that I come in contact with. Mm -hmm. Um just a little bit more comfort in my own skin. Um, you know, that's like the broad stroke of what I think that the, the answer is. Mm -hmm. I guess. So just a little bit calmer. You know, I just, there was plenty. There's been plenty of drama in my life. Uh, <laughs> like, like everybody, yeah. Yeah, I mean, like terror and panic and lots of joy and just like a lot of extreme stuff. Um, and, and that will still happen. I don't, I don't know, man. I'm just like, just grown up a little bit, I guess. Grown, grown up and just less things seem to be vitally important as time goes on. You know, rather than a hundred things, it's like 10 things, you know, cool. and that has made me a little bit calmer, I guess. Yeah, I, I think I think that's that's my answer. Well, man, let me tell people uh, where they could find you, and thank you again very much for your time and, and honesty. First of all, uh, it's Timothy Drury. You can check him out on tour with Don Felder. Number two, he has a really cool instrumental record, which is available on iTunes, and it's getting a lot of play commercially, actually. And you could also go to Timothy Drury Music. Again, it's D R U R Y, Timothy Drury Music dot com. And talk about one thing that's really cool is the Performance Cube. The Performance Cube is my uh, my my means of using all of my gifts together uh, in the same in the same show, in the same room. So I have created this cube shaped performance space. Um it's eight feet by eight feet and it's sheer fabric 
And I'm inside of this eight foot by eight foot cube of sheer fabric playing my instrumental music while projecting my images and videos from behind me. So the projector hits the back of this cube and it fills up the entire cube with imagery. And I'm in silhouette playing my keyboard music, my instrumental kind of film score-ish cinematic music while this is happening. And I've been doing more and more of these shows at, at various events and corporate gigs. And um, it's really, really cool. It's really exciting for me because I'm literally inside my work. I get to use my visual work and my composing and my performance um, and it creates a really stunning kind of visual atmosphere at these events so that is making me really happy right now and i saw a video of it you have a couple of videos on youtube i believe vimeo yeah on vimeo sorry where can people find those if they go to vimeo.com v-i-m-e-o.com and search for if you search for timothy drury on vimeo i believe you can find some of these films, some of these performances that I've done. And and what is what? Give some examples of where this would be. Where do you find most people are hiring you to perform them? Like what kind of environments? Lately, it's been corporate events, uh, like a big gala dinner events or cocktail events, where a corporation gets together for their yearly. Um, aren't we great kind of, uh, event. And, and, uh, I'll play either during their, their dinner or cocktail or event or after, after dinner, um, as an atmosphere in the room. Um, and I've done a lot of conferences like tech conferences, uh, companies that are trying to show the, the, the connection between art and technology. And I fit right in there because yeah, I'm totally saying, using gear and laptops and projectors and music in a kind of a pure art way, but I need the technology to put it all together. So I've done some great events for uh, sponsored by Apple and I, I played at MIT at the new media, new media lab. And that was, that was a thrill um, because you've got audiences of, of scientists and code writing like geniuses and, uh, they're just mesmerized by this pure, purely artistic sort of thing, right? It's it's funny to see someone who uses their brain in one way be sort of like childlike, be like a kid looking at beautiful pictures and listening to beautiful music. It's it's really kind of cool. When I see that sort of reaction, especially from somebody who maybe doesn't do that all the time, I feel like I've reached people on a on a pretty deep level. Yeah, I would imagine that these are a lot of these people are like not ever exposed because, you know, especially in the tech area, they're working 24 seven and they may not have any clue that stuff like this even exists. Yeah. Yeah. So it's been great. It's been a great opportunity to go, hey, everybody, thanks for inventing this stuff. This is what you can do with it. So everybody's cool. happy, you know. And and how could people get a hold of you if they're interested in 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 hiring you to do the performance cube or talking to you about any of your stuff that you do? Well, they can just go to Timothy com, and my email address is, is there. I'm very easy to find. If you type me into Google, you know, I'm, I'm not, I'm not that hidden. Um, you can go to Instagram as well to see more of my photographic work. Um, uh, God, I, I urge people to reach out. Uh, for for sure, I, I like uh, talking to people and collaborating with people, and I I definitely want to promote the performance cube for anybody who's interested in uh, having me do a performance for sure. Awesome, and you're a hell of a nice guy, and I really appreciate talking to you, man. Thank you again for all your time and uh, generous stories, man. Thank you, thank you for the great questions. Thanks for the interest and the curiosity, man. Thank you. You're welcome. Um, everybody, thank you so much for listening. I hope you enjoyed this interview as much as I did. And thanks again to Timothy Drury for spending time with us. Check him out online at timothydrurymusic.com and check out the music cube on vimeo.com. It's kind of, it's very different and really cool. Go to everyonelovesguitar.com. Sign up to get notified about future episodes along with some cool stuff we have for guitar players. Now be nice, go play your guitar and have some fun. Till next time, peace and love and I am out. 
hope you enjoyed this show. If you did, subscribe to the Everyone Loves Guitar podcast, and you can do this online at everyonelovesguitar.com or on iTunes. And if you like the show, please leave us a five-star positive review. The more five-star reviews we get, the higher our show ranks, and higher rankings mean we get to continue speaking with cool, interesting guests on our show. We'll see you on the next episode, and until then, keep playing your guitar and have fun making music. Music.